Hello, 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 everyone, and uh, welcome. I really don't know which is the number of the Equal Week webinar that we are hitting, and uh, I'm really glad uh, for today to to organize the session today with uh, Intel Skills for Innovation. I'm really looking forward to see what they have prepared for us. Uh, uh, just to let you know and to always remember that Equal Week is running through the whole year and uh, that if you organize your activities, if you find something interest and put it in your classroom for today, please upload it to the Ucod Week map. We're always uh, uh, cheerful and happy to see what you prepare and what you are doing with your, uh, with your students. Uh, and uh, I will welcome Margaret for today's session. Uh, she will guide us through. I will be quite uh, quiet uh, and uh, taking notes about what's going to happen. Uh, but um, I'm really, really glad that we managed to have this session because out of um, the description and the blog post that we posted out of it, it's it seemed quite fascinating from uh, from my side and uh, really, really looking forward. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Crystal. Welcome with us. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you, everyone, for, for joining um, us today. Um, like... Um, like I said earlier, a few little guidelines on the screen um, for everyone, but I don't want to take up too much more time. Um, we're already five past the hour, so let's go ahead and jump in. Let's so do it. <laughs> the Code Week webinar is all about empowering educators and is about decomposition in the classroom. So if that is not what you signed up for, now is your time to escape. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Margaret Perdue. I am currently the Intel SFI Community Manager. I am an educator by trade. My degree is in elementary education. Um, I currently reside in Hayes, Kansas in the U.S. So if you're looking at the United States and you point straight at the middle, that's probably where I am. Um, I have taught middle school uh, for six years. Um, that's like 12, 13 years old. I taught math, science, and communications. Um, it was really fun. I feel like if you can captivate the audience of middle schoolers, you can do just about anything. Um, a little fun fact about myself is that I played soccer in college, um, and I am currently trying to train for a marathon. So I'm in the early stages, so we'll see um, how well those for myself. Um, just so you know, I am going to be standing today. I, as a former educator, I am used to standing, moving about the room, talking with my hands. Um, feel free if you need to get move. That is totally okay. Grab yourself a drink of water. I'm going to probably have to do the same with talking. Um, and just make sure, um, you know, that you have the things that you need to be able to, to engage with us today. So before we jump into our content, I want to do a quick little check in. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and click here and it's going to take us here. Um, what this is, is this is a little poll. Um, these, this is the first time that you can use your phone for the QR code. If you don't have your QR code, you can just go to the menti.com at the bottom and then enter that code. The question that we are going to answer today is how do you feel about integrating computational thinking and decomposition into classroom lessons as of right now? Um, if you are having trouble with this, just put something in the chat and we can see how we can help you out. Um, but you, what are your thoughts about, you know, coming into this? Maybe you have some knowledge about it already. Maybe you don't really know anything about it at all. So just kind of type in. You can put an emoji of how you feel. You can put up to three things. You don't have to put three things. You could put an emoji. You could put words. Um, just kind of your thoughts and feelings around this concept for today. And as those come in, we can kind of see where everybody is. Um, kind of a sliding scale of, of where everyone is, is working. So we have a little word excitement, imagination, project-based learning, 
happy, inspirational. So we can see kind of the, oh, look at those. There come the emojis, cute. Um, excited celebration. Um, we'll wait for a few more to come in as we are building kind of our word wall here. If we have anyone else who wants to jump in. Power coding future. Mm -hmm. Happy. Another thumbs up. Inspirational. Awesome. Just a little bit longer and then. Team working. I like that one. Essential. Wow, that's a good one. Yeah, I like that. Awesome. Give just a little bit, maybe 20 more seconds if anyone else hasn't been able to get onto there, if you're having a little bit of difficulty. Um, so just go ahead and take a look and we can kind of see where everybody is it coming into this. We have you know a lot of excitement um, talking about how you know there is power within uh, computational thinking and decomposition, creative, having to use your imagination, it being essential, and we'll talk a little bit about that and talking about the future and especially how we can integrate this um, into our classrooms for our students. Inspire, very cool. Oh, they just keep coming. Algorithms, great. Abstraction, ooh, okay. I like that. All right, we're gonna go ahead and, and keep um, moving forward. All right, so before we jump in again to the content, I'm going to do a quick little video, okay? And this quick little video is going to talk about the four elements of computational thinking and um, a little example of how another educator is kind of integrating those things into their classroom and kind of breaking down and giving us a little definition of each of those things. Let me know if you can't hear and we'll make sure that the audio is working. No, okay, someone's saying no audio. Let's let's make sure we have let's try that one more time then. And how hard it is to take into account all the situations a computer might run into. We also learn about working together, a trait so important in programming it has a special word, pair programming. The children learned about dealing with failure, debugging with call it when you look carefully through the code you've written and use logical reasoning to explain where the error is and very importantly they learned that programming is very creative there is no one way to solve the problem what else well they went through four of the computational thinking concepts we are going to be focusing on today first we brought broke the task into pieces. We spotted similarities, things that belong together. We tried to come up with a name to describe these things. And finally, we made a step-by-step -step instruction on how to brush your teeth. We'll start with decomposition, which is breaking a problem into parts or steps. This is something students do every day. They analyze a story, work on math problems, plan the route to the school. In programming, Code is often broken into chunks of code you can refer to. Decomposition is important because it allows several people to work together on a team and makes the code more easy to update. So in the very beginning, the kids needed to figure out the different parts of the problem of brushing your teeth. Toothbrush, toothpaste, water, brushing, spitting, movement, and look at each one again through the eyes of the computer. The next thing we'll talk about is pattern recognition, things that are similar to one another. 
Recognizing and reusing patterns is something we do in our everyday lives, whether it's when we learn a new language, look at a piece of music or study the patterns in economics. After a little time coding, you will recognize that you keep writing similar blocks of code time and time again. These common solutions to common problems help keep your code structured and easy to work with. Even though these pastries all look different, the ingredients are similar. Finally, let's talk about abstraction. It's at the heart of computer science and it's all about capturing the important structure of a system or a problem, but not worrying too much about the details. It's the ability to generalize patterns and trends into rules, principles and insights. A map is an abstraction of the real world. It can't be too vague, but can't show every little rock on the ground. Chemistry abstracts the properties of chemical bonding so that we can have a discussion about it. In math, we abstract or generalize formulas when we use variables instead of numbers like y equals x2. Imagine we wanted to change the color of the toothbrush. Instead of going to seven different places in the code, we can just fix it at one place. That's a good abstraction. And this brings us to algorithms. We'll talk about algorithms in more detail later, but at the end of the activity, the children actually did create their very first algorithms. A sequence of instructions or a set of rules to get something done. Algorithms, unlike programs, are written for humans to read. What is computational thinking and what does it mean to teach it? Seymour Popper is talking about introducing tools to think with. And Jeanette Wing is talking about understanding problem solving with computers. But I think they are both referring to the same thing. Finding the aspects of computer science that are simultaneously personal and universal. Making computer science approachable and lowering the barrier of entry. Computational thinking is something that will help you and your students to start to recognize how computer science skills apply to other domains and how you can sneak in thinking around computer science into arts, physical education, English and math. Computational thinking gives an understanding of the artificial world, but it also gives a new way of understanding the natural world. Yeah. Margaret, you're muted. We're like she was saying, we're going to take some of those items um, from the the computer world and see how we can integrate those into our everyday teaching. So in our overview today, what we are going to be covering is we are going to be um, going through understanding what computational thinking and, and a decompositional mindset is. We are going to introduce five different mental modes to break down problems. We are going to have an activity and learn how to integrate decomposition um, and computational thinking into different lessons that we have um, in our classrooms. And additionally, we are going to, at the end, at show and showcase the Skills for Innovation platform where you can continue this type of learning. Um, so let's go ahead and we were, are gonna jump in and talk a little bit more about decomposition. So when we think about decomposition, we're really thinking about solving a complex problem, but breaking it down into more bite-sized pieces and being a, in more manageable tasks. So we can think of this if, if you have a child or, or one of your students. The, an example I like to give is if I were to tell um, a child, a student, go clean your room. That is a big task. That is a big problem, right? There are many little steps that go into cleaning that room. That could be, you know, when we talk about cleaning our room, it's not just one thing. We have to break that down into many different tasks. Now, our students may not know how to do that yet. So, um, or your child may not know how to do that yet. They, You may say, go clean your room, and they do a couple of things, and there's a large likelihood that you are going to go check to see if that room is clean, and in fact, it is not going to be. And that's where computation 
still thinking and decomposition comes in. We can take that task of cleaning the room, the problem, the room needs to be clean, and break that down into a subset of more manageable tasks for our child. Now, this is something we as adults, we do this all the time without even thinking about it, right? If we were to clean our room and we were to walk in, we'd be like, okay, I'm going to put, you know, my dirty clothes in the laundry bin, I'm going to hang up my coat, I'm going to make my bed, do this, I'm going to get the vacuum. We have broken it down into really manageable steps. However, if our, our students and our children have a harder time breaking those pieces down, and that's where we as, as an educator can come in and make those more manageable bite-sized pieces. Okay, yes, the objective, the goal is clean the room, get your room to, to a cleanliness state. So what are the steps that we need to do to get there? Okay, first, maybe you you look at your floor. What is dirty? Okay, we're going to put the dirty clothes in the bin. And then we're going to put our other clothes, we're going to hang them up or put them in our drawers. Then you're going to make your bed. Then you're going to vacuum, sweep. So breaking down, again, these huge problems into these more manageable bite-sized tasks. And this, again, is something that we as adults and kids do all of the time without really thinking about it. And this is just giving it a more of giving it a name. But the thing here is that we can utilize decomposition. We can utilize this strategy um, in, in our everyday classroom in helping our students understand and come up with better strategies to solve problems. So for here, we have an instance. There is an issue here, right? There is a fire in the oven, in the stove. So what what could be, you know, what could be one of the reasons, what could be one of the pieces that are missing in, in this algorithm per se, all right? What, what could have been the missing piece of code that went wrong here? If you have any ideas, go ahead and throw those in the chat and we'll see. Um, this could be, you know, a few different things. It could be a timer wasn't set. Um, and that could be the break in the link. It could be that um, timer. Yep, th there's a timer. It could be that maybe the oven was too hot. We missed the step on preheating the oven. Um, it could trying out a new recipe, um, you know, not knowing what you're doing before. Um, I thought that one's great. So again, here, there are there are things, there are links that may be missing in this, which is why a specific problem ended up occurring. So figuring out why that problem happened and then being able to remedy that problem. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about mental mo models or um, tools that we can utilize to help us break down these problems into more manageable tasks and to help us find solutions. So there are five different ones that we are going to talk about. Um, the five whys, user flow, five W1H, the problem tree, and the fishbone diagram. Um, these are the five different mental models and we're going to break down each one of those with a specific chart. This first one is called the five whys. It's where you repeatedly ask why to uncover the reasons to your problem. I also like to call this the toddler model because if you have ever been around a toddler for any point of time or you have had a toddler of your own, you are going to hear this question a lot, right? We need to get ready to go to school, why? because we are we go to school so we so we can learn why so that we can have knowledge when we grow why all right so the five whys is is the toddler model okay we're asking why until we get to that root cause um if you so now you know if you have ever been around a toddler if you have a toddler and they start asking why you can instead of being frustrated you can be just ecstatic that they are using decomposition and computational thinking your toddler crushing it okay so that is the first mental model is the five whys 
The second one to look at is called user flow. OK, and this is basically taking um, the steps involved in preparing the meal um, to serving them to try to identify any pitfalls that may arise. Right. So if we start here, we have a specific action and you make this a specific decision. OK, what could potentially happen if I forget to uh, if I set my timer, then result, I'm going to know when it goes off and I'm going to know when to go back to check my item in the oven. If I, you know, if I choose to try a different ingredient than what it asks for, the result could be the cook time would be different. So this user flow is really looking at, you know, taking these things apart and trying to break down and identify where potential pitfalls could be. The next one is called the, I think, yes, the next one is called the problem tree. The problem tree um, starts uh, with the problem in the middle or on the ground, the soil. And then at the, the top, um, we have the effects. And at the bottom, we have the root causes. So looking at the bottom, all right, the root causes, what are, what are the things that are happening? And then what grows out of those root are the effects, okay? So if we make these specific decisions, um, if we break it down this way, what is going to grow and come from those specific decisions. The 5W1H method, this is kind of the who, what, when, where um, of the problem. So you can take up that specific item, whatever topic it may be, put that in to this flow chart and then answer the, these questions. What, why did that happen, where, when, who, and how did this happen to really go and dissect that problem into more bite-sized pieces to understand where something may have gone wrong or how to complete the process. The last one is called the fishbone diagram, and this is identifying like main categories or main causes. So there could be, you know, at the at the front, we see kind of where the, the head of the fish, you know, kind of the, the things coming out looks like a fishbone, um, hence the name. But you can put your problem there at the head and then those main causes, maybe the cooking equipment, um, the recipe, distraction actions and then analyze what are those different root causes for each action within that category. So those are the five mental models that we are going to be kind of uh, practicing with um, and practicing our decomposition with today. So we are going to try it out. This is the this is the activity section of the webinar today. So we are going to get into breakout groups. Um, each group is going to uh, decide on an aspect of your morning routine. It doesn't have to, you know, actually just something, you know, maybe you could improve on. Collectively decide together that you would like to improve. Maybe you want to get ready faster. Maybe you want to start making coffee at home. Maybe you want to try to find time to exercise in the morning or you want to try to meditate or drink water when you wake up. I know that I have to start drinking water at the beginning of the day or it does not happen for me. Then what we're going to do is your group is going to be assigned a mental model and we you're going to practice breaking down this routine to solve this problem. So let's go ahead. We're going to go in. Um, if we can go ahead and put this Google Doc into the chat, it should be shareable and everyone should be able to access. So we're going to put that in the chat. Here shortly and while that is it should be in there now. So go ahead. I'll let you click on that and I'm going to kind of go over some of the instructions while we do that. So the directions for this activity. You are going to be put into groups. OK, we're going to be in five different groups. Um, so on each slide. You will see that there is the name of the mental model that you have, a picture of the mental model, and then the link. 
So what we're going to do is once you get into your groups, we'll, the, we'll get those all assigned. You're going to click on that Miro link. That link is going to take you to a page that really goes into a little bit more detail than the short, quick explanation that I gave you um, about your, uh, your mental model. So you can go in, read that, maybe take a few minutes, just kind of skim through. And then what you're going to do is you're going to come back to your slide. And once you have um, your group members back at your slide, what you're going to do is you're going to agree on your problem. Maybe you're like, oh, we're going to all eat breakfast. Super, love it. Let's crush it. So then what we're going to do is you are going to put your problem for this one. Then you would say, why? Because now to kind of fill this in, you are free to, you know, maybe put some shapes, some text boxes. Um, you know, this this is to kind of utilize this this model, this reference to solve this problem. Now, you don't necessarily have to, you know, I know some of them are smaller, but really try to talk through and work through the model um, in solving this problem. Then what we're going to do is we will come back and we will share our different models out. So when you're in your group, pick someone who would like to share your slide. Maybe you wanna do rock, paper, scissors. I don't know, just some draw straws, something. Um, to figure out who is going to give a little summary of your slide and how you broke that down. Before we jump into that, are there any questions? If you have a question, go ahead, throw that in the chat right now. If I didn't cover something. The great thing about this, this Google Doc is we'll be able to share this and be able to see everyone's work all together. OK, I'm not seeing any questions, which I guess means everybody understands it perfectly, which is great. Excellent. Yes, we are ready. Yes, we are needing to get put into five different groups. Yes, the rooms are assigned. Uh, just the one question, Margaret, the, you and Christy, are you want to assign in one group or uh, uh, just uh, stay here and like make a round to see? I can just hop into different groups, yeah. Yeah, yeah, great, great, okay. And uh, so, so see you in 15 minutes. All right, thanks everyone.
Okay. Let's see if we have people starting Sally, to put some Anna Sai, Anna Sai and um, Crystal as well. Let's just give it maybe a little. Will you bring Crystal back in here real quick? Okay, I think um, because of the different languages, we're having a little bit of um, a barrier. So let's go ahead. Um, or like we can we can close the the rooms in three minutes. It's fine. Can we close them early? Yes, just right, let's when. go ahead and close them because I think there is a little bit of difficulty with our rooms. Okay. Because of the lesson plan. Hello. All right. I think we're all coming back. Um, I think we had maybe a little bit of confusion with the groups and there's just a lot of different things going on. So we're just going to. We're going to pivot a little bit um, and we are going to kind of just talk through these different items. So if you want to go ahead and have those up on your screen, the different groups, um, I will share um, the the different models and we can kind of talk through them and, and kind of fill it out a little bit together to kind of practice each one of those models. I think this is going to be a little more efficient and really give us um, an idea of how to use each one of these. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. And we'll jump back into it. Um, so this person who had the the first one was in the first group for the five whys. They figured out that they want the problem was is they wanted to make their morning routine more efficient. So then in utilizing the five whys, what we would do is we would ask the question, why? Why do we want to make this morning routine more efficient? So if uh, in the chat, put, um, you know, why would we want to make, why would you want to make your morning routine more efficient? What could be one of the reasons? Anyone can throw something in there. Um, what, what could be one of the reasons? Uh, maybe you are, maybe you're someone who has a hard time getting up in the morning to go to work earlier. That's a great to improve health. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, maybe it's because you're like late all the time and you want to be more timely. Um, let's go with the one um, up here. Okay, which would then lead us, we say why. So we want to improve our health because why do we want to improve our health? What's the point of improving our health? Why would we do that? This is our toddler method, right? We want to make our morning routine more efficient. Why? Because I want my health to improve. Why? Why could we want our health to improve? To live longer. Yeah, that would be probably good. To have a more productive work from home life. Yes, that would be lovely. Okay. Okay. So why 
do we want better time management? Why do we want better time to take part in the marathon? Yeah, that would help. I'm going to have to do a lot of, a lot of running. So we won't have to go through this entire thing, but you can kind of see how this breaks down, right? We want to make our routine more efficient. Okay, why? Because it's going to improve our health. And then you can live longer, um, you have better time management, you can have, um, you can achieve your goals at work. All right, so that again is the five whys. And this can be applied to our thinking in our classrooms with our students. So if we apply the same thing um, to the user flow to make our morning routine more efficient, okay, what is a potential action that we could take to make our routine more efficient in the morning? What could we do? What is an action we could take to make our morning routine more efficient. Maybe it's, you know, plan your outfits in advance or um, make your lunch the night before. Wake up earlier. Mm -hmm. And then when you when you're choosing to wake up earlier, you have a decision that you to to do. You either wake up or you hit snooze, right? So if you wake up earlier, what's the result? You're going to have more time to do all of these things that you're wanting to. If you hit snooze, that's the action. The result is going to be maybe you're late, maybe you don't have time to eat breakfast, maybe um, you know you get stuck in traffic. Okay, so that is how we kind of use the user flow. More time for myself and coffee. Yes. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you could be late. All right. So then going to this, this next one, this is kind of the who, what, when, where, why, how, okay? So just, we'll, this one's pretty easy. So what we're gonna do is kind of just talk through this one real quick. So to make our morning routine more efficient, what can we do? Like we've already talked about a lot of these things. We could set an alarm, we could make our lunch before. Um, why? We've talked about, we would like to be more efficient. We have goals that we want to achieve. Um, where? How are we going to do this? At our house? When? Establish when? Who? You? And then how are you specifically going to accomplish that? Group four is the problem tree. So our problem is the soil, right? And we want to make our, our tree more efficient. So we have two different things we can do here. We can look at the root causes, right? What are the things that are, are potentially happening that um, we want to look at changing? You're like, you are, if you wake up early, then what's the effect? If you hit snooze, what's what grows from that? If you have more time in the morning, what grows from that? So that is really how to use the this problem tree. Again, this is it's kind it's pretty repetitive when we're talking through it because these are all just different models for kind of the same thing, right? We're not reinventing the wheel with each one of these charts. It's just orchestrated in a different way um, for us to kind of organize our thinking. And so then the last one is the fishbone. We can look at the main causes again and break those items down. Setting your alarm. Okay, what are the what are the items that come from that? Um, you know, setting out your clothing the night before. So what are the what are the effects from that? Okay, so again, the, all of these different mental models are tools that you can utilize for yourself in trying to break something down, breaking down a lesson in an effective way, or to help your students um, break down problems in the classroom. Okay, so we're gonna head on back here. 
before we go to this classroom application, I want to share um, an example of how I have used personally um, this deconstruction um, and decomposition and computational thinking in my classroom. I didn't necessarily specifically use it um, for my students, but for a specific type of project. So in my classroom, we had a unit where we did these huge PowerPoints over natural disasters. And what was happening was they were to make a PowerPoint and then they were presenting it. Um, and if you teach middle school or younger, um, you know, if you say go make a PowerPoint, if that's the instruction, if that's the problem, what you get back is probably not going to be what you are envisioning, okay? So what I have had to do is I took the process of creating a PowerPoint, right? And I broke that down into very manageable bite-sized steps for my students on how they were going to create this PowerPoint. All right, so the first thing that you were going to do, okay, you were going to have five minutes to work on your title slide. You're going to have however many minutes to pick your theme because middle schoolers, at least in, in Kansas, will spend forever going through and looking at all of the different themes, adding animations, right? So we give them, we take the whole concept of creating a PowerPoint and break it down again into more bite-sized pieces. Again, for us, this would be kind of a no-brainer. Like, yeah, we start with this, then we break it down, use the bullet points, but, this is a skill that we have already learned. And by integrating this decomposition in the classroom, not only are you teaching the content, right? We're not only learning about natural disasters, but they are also through this process, learning the skill of how to create an effective presentation and how to break down. They're visually seeing how those this whole project of creating a PowerPoint was broken down into smaller skills that are more manageable to complete. Um, and that was just a quick example that I wanted to give to how I have utilized um, this in my classroom. So what I would like you to do now, um, either in the link that is in the chat or to scan with your QR code, go ahead and um, go ahead and go to this Padlet and you will see some examples of how we can utilize this in our classroom. Um, I will pull it up and you'll see do, do, do. So the question is, what is one unit or lesson that you could incorporate computational thinking and decomposition? What I'm wanting you to do here is to read a post, comment on a post, and write your own post. You do not have to do it in that order. You can go rogue and write your post first and then like something and then, you know, comment on something later. Um, but really kind of thinking about, okay, not I attended this webinar. Awesome. Great. What can I take from this lesson that this webinar that we are at today? How can I actually apply this topic into my classroom every day to help um, our students with this decomposition and computational thinking? We have one, I'm English, use the fish, you use the fish bone diagram. Okay, that's awesome. Different categories of their story. Yeah, again, that breaking down. What are the items that go beneath that? See what else we have going on here. Feel free to jump in. If you're having any difficulties, please put something in the chat and we'll make sure um, to help you out. Give it a little bit of time. Okay, designing and programming, programming a maze solving robot. Breaking down. 
students with poverty experimenting with that is really cool. Love that. Love that. Awesome. Maybe we can also share this Padlet afterwards with the participants so they can reflect more, yes, like keep it course. work maybe on it because it's a I really see. great uh, tool as I can see and uh, it can uh, help a lot to to actually use all these practical uh, tools that uh, you presented, Margaret, which uh, yeah. I find uh, like really align with uh, Code Week and what we promote and that's uh, amazing indeed. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and as you're you're reading, you know, you can comment on these as well. And what are you, you know, are there other things that you like like you were seeing that you were seeing on this wall that oh maybe I could take that piece as well? I haven't thought about how I could incorporate that in my classroom, but I really like that. I'm gonna take that piece um with me today as well back to my classroom. Asking why five times. Yes, the toddler method. We love it. I'm sure people will uh, try, you know, to think of what, how they are doing yeah. and type and uh, see how, how they go. And yeah, and it can be something as simple as like looking at a it doesn't have to necessarily be aligned with a specific curriculum it could be you know breaking down um for 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 younger kiddos it could be breaking down specific tasks right it could be if you were in the younger ages like okay what is our procedure for getting ready at the end of the day okay first we do this then we do this then we do this and then as they continue to do that more and more um and after we've broken it down it becomes more um, automatic for them in their thinking. And uh, something else that uh, I wanted to mention, uh, I don't know if Margaret, you agree that this is a great tool, uh, the composition in general to use for inclusion in the classroom. Yeah. So for uh, hard exercises on, you know, like if the level of difficulty, it's higher for some students just to give them another piece so they can break mm -hmm. down and stop mm -hmm. at the level they feel more comfortable. So the whole mm -hmm. students can take part in the same activity uh, because yeah. I find this a really, really, helpful especially for uh, for students you know with uh, dyslexia for example and dictation mm -hmm. it's always good mm -hmm. to, to to make it uh, to use simpler steps to, so you can uh, reach the point that you want and the results that uh, you are looking forward to so for right. me it's uh, it's a great tool to you know like think of how you can implement it uh, right in your classroom Right, right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay, well, thank you for everyone who um, added something on our Padlet. That, those were really, really great ideas. Um, looking at our next slide, we um, want to go ahead and take a look at our SFI and our different starter packs. So today when we were talking about decomposition and computational thinking, this was pulled from one of our professional development items um, that is located on our SFI website. So if you go to our Intel SFI, And we go to our professional development. Maybe. You will see that in our professional development area, we have four levels of professional development with courses, and then there are courselets in in those courses. So kind of its own little decomposition situation happening. Um, but where we were today is we were in the higher order thinking and SFI mindsets and skills. So if I click on that and I go in there, 
then we were in this integrating computational thinking in the classroom. We were in that second one today. And if we go in there, we'll see that there are three other units that you can complete for professional development um, for how to integrate computational thinking into your classroom. So this is the SFI platform. Not only do we just have this professional development that you can go in and all these modules are just housed on the website. We also have different starter packs that you can utilize. The starter packs are a great resource for, for teachers. Um, they have all of the, the educator guides, the slide decks, everything all ready for you. Um, a lot of them are have to do a little bit more with STEM, but some take just um, regular concepts such as the water cycle that you would already be teaching in the classroom and integrating technology um, into those different pieces using a wide variety of technologies such as Scratch, CoSpaces, um, Python, a lot of different really fun things. And these are all housed here. I've got it got me out. I'm going to go back to it. Well, it kicked me out. There we go. So one more thing I wanted to talk about with you all to date was our um, ambassador program. And our ambassador program is something um, that we really love um, and we have worked really hard on here at the um, SFI platform. It is a program where you can get more involved. Um, it is a community of users that are on the SFI platform where we share best practices, create new content, get to share ideas. Um, it also has some pretty cool perks that can come along with it. Um, to become an SFI ambassador, what we ask for um, the silver ambassador, there are two different levels. There are the silver and the gold. For silver, it is to implement one of those starter packs that I just talked about in your classroom and then to submit a little essay reflection on that starter pack. The second is the gold ambassador and that is attending um, the train the specific trainings for the starter packs and professional development. You um, then becoming an expert on the SFI platform and then teaching other teachers about the platform. Um, as well as working on creating some forum posts. So not only does this provide um, more value to you um, in, in the sense of having a space in a community, but it also provides um, things like being able to come on different trips, um, conferences, being included on exclusive webinars and things like that as well. Last thing, as I as uh, we are wrapping up our time here, I have a quick survey that I would ask everyone um, to fill out real quickly because it allows us to take that feedback to really, um, you know, reflect and see what we can do and how we can, um, you know, incorporate different items in the future. Again, there is the um, the QR code is here, and then we we can put that link in the chat as well. Um, once you uh, finish that survey, just come right back here um, and then I will answer any questions before we leave today. Thank you so much yes. uh, for this great presentation. I'm sure once people will take the survey, they can come back and ask uh, questions and see if they have uh, things. But, uh, to, to ask you directly for the whole presentation. Uh, I would like to say that we are going to share everything uh, via email, also like uh, the videos, registration links, some tips and tools so for, awesome. uh, for the program. So uh, Margaret and Chris will uh, help us uh, draft the email. So you, you will have it also written after the webinar in case you find it easier to have all 
information in one email and also this will come together with a recording of the webinar because we will share this uh, with you as well and um, yes we would like to hear your comments and see if you enjoy the session and uh, if you would like to see uh, similar sessions from uh, EU Code Week uh, webinar series, it would be great to, to have your feedback as always. But thank yeah. you, everyone. Thank you, Margaret. Also, yeah. thank you, all of you, that you bear with us. You, you stayed the whole time with us. It was uh, great. And if you have any yeah, questions, just... Thank uh, you. I know we had a... Yeah, we had a couple of technical difficulties, but I mean, that's education for you. If you're not having a technical difficulty, are you uh, are you really teaching? I don't know. <laughs> um, and before we go, I was hoping we could grab a quick photo, um, just a screenshot if, if you would like to show um, turn on your camera. If not, that is totally okay. Again, my information is also listed on the, the screen. Um, so if you need to contact me for any other information, please feel free to, to do so. I'm going to give like a second or so for other people who maybe want to turn on their cameras. Again, no pressure, no pressure. Smile, look pretty. Cheese. We love to see faces. Yes. Oh, look at all of you. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. You look so great. Okay. Are we ready? Are you cheesing? One, two, three. I got it. Perfect. Again, everyone, thank you so, so much for attending. Thank you for your participation. This was so awesome. I had an absolute blast. If you have any other questions, um, need any other information, please do not hesitate to reach out. Um, thank you so much, and I'll, I'll hand it back over. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all indeed. It was, uh, it was great. And also seeing uh, familiar faces of our communities are always uh, such a great pleasure. Thank you all for taking time to, to, to be with us today. And uh, as always, uh, we will communicate every single detail of these sessions with all of you. Uh, stay tuned uh, for uh, all the things that are coming up for the Ukodwe community. As you see, we we have great uh, partners that uh, they are willing to share with you their uh, tips and toes and uh, uh, really hands-on sessions for your classrooms, which uh, I find really inspirational myself. So thank you all. Uh, I'm not going to keep you further. I'm going to close the meeting. And first of all, I should thank um, Skills for Innovation for, and Margaret and Crystal for organizing this. And uh, on behalf of the Ucor Week team, if you need anything, we will be always here. Don't forget to upload your activities in the map. And if you find, uh, and if you need any further inspiration, uh, our new Ucor Week podcast series is now on. So you can uh, go and check our podcast. It's a, it's a great, uh, um, great thing to also share with your young uh, students. They will love it, I'm sure. So till next time. Thank you and uh, have a nice uh, weekend just in one day away. So <laughs> bear with me, <laughs> we can do it. Thank you all for joining.